practice medicine. Known for groundbreaking research, teaching, and medical care. Welcome to Facebook Live from Johns Hopkins Medicine. I'm Elizabeth Tracy. And I'm Sashank Reddy, a craniofacial surgeon at Johns Hopkins. I'm going to ask you to start first of all by defining a craniofacial surgeon. Oh, sure, Elizabeth. Uh, that's just to say that I'm a specialized plastic surgeon who's done additional training to work on the structures of the face and uh, deeper in your head. And of course, a super specialist. We're here today talking about headaches. And before we start talking about the very specific set of headaches you deal with, I wonder if you just educate me a little bit on the broader subject of headaches. They're really common, aren't they? Oh, extremely common. Yeah, from the sort of garden variety headaches that all of us get once in a while and maybe more often in these unprecedented times to the more debilitating kind, uh, chronic headaches. Um, there's many different kinds and they can be a significant source of um, problem for patients. Would you say that most people could expect to suffer headaches in their lifetime? Yeah, I mean, many people, as I say, will get occasional headaches, but um, the more uh, problematic kind, the headache disorders like migraine headaches or chronic headaches of various other sorts are surprisingly common. And for patients who suffer from them, they can be a source, as I mentioned, of significant ability, disability, missed work, uh, and other sorts of problems for those patients. Well, not to mention the pain. Of course. Yeah, so difficult to deal with. Who do people turn to to deal with their headaches? You know, the quarterback of uh, an effective headache management strategy is always neurology, neurologists, and there are within neurology specialists in headache medicine. And the good news is, um, as uh, our understanding of various types of headaches has increased over time, there are more and more medical and um, non-medical options for dealing with those headaches. More tools in the neurologist toolkit. You have educated me that there's a subset of headaches that are the result of trauma. Yes, yeah, absolutely. So there are some patients who suffer, say, head trauma or concussions uh, for whom headache is a long-term sequela. And in fact, for many patients who have uh, concussions, headache is at least a short-term component of their um, uh, of their symptoms. Now the good news is for the majority of those patients, they get better with time and with appropriate medical management. But for some subset of those patients, they'll last well beyond um, a, a reasonable period of time. And that's of course your specialty. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's one of the areas that I focus on is that for um, a subset of patients with post-traumatic headaches, they can be uh, amenable to surgical solutions. I will say that even for those patients with post-traumatic headaches, the majority of them can be adequately managed with medical management. That's the good news. Let's explore that just a little bit further. So when somebody has an injury that's mostly resulting in an injury to their head, mm -hmm. they could end up with a headache following that that ends up persisting. Yes. What is the first thing they should do if that's the case? Yeah, the first thing is um, I, it, that I would suggest is to see a, a headache specialist. And typically these folks are in neurology, but if you can't have access to somebody like that, even your primary care doctor is the first bet. And those folks can help to discriminate between the various causes of persistent headaches, some of which are more concerning than others, and they can individually tailor management accordingly. And when should somebody then come to see someone like you? Yeah, that's a great question. That's typically referred by one of these headache specialists. And the kinds of folks that might be, um, <coughs> pardon me, amenable to surgical solutions are patients for whom they've had good response to nerve blocks, um, suggesting that they have a particular anatomic locus that could be helped by surgery. I'm a little lost here. The anatomic locus, would you mind describing just a little bit more where that might be? Yeah, absolutely. Sorry, I rolled out the million dollar word there. The, the idea is that um, for certain patients with headaches, they can be triggered or at least um, a significant component of their pain is due to uh, pressure or damage to peripheral nerves across the face and scalp. So we have these nerves all over our body. They're responsible for normal pressure and, and touch sensation. But sometimes when they get compressed or damaged, they can trigger pain locally or that can manifest in headaches. So for patients like that, when we've narrowed down that diagnosis and they, um, but it still persists, we can relieve pressure on those nerves through surgical approaches and in some cases through non-surgical approaches. It seems to me that being able to evaluate that kind of pain of whether that's gonna be something that's gonna respond to surgery might involve some imaging, is that correct? 
Um, it can, although the most, and so there are imaging studies that have been done, including at Johns Hopkins, to, to help us understand what can happen to individual nerves um, in response to trauma or even in, in um, other causes of chronic headache. But I would actually say that the most reliable uh, tests here are actually the old-fashioned physical exam, identifying those trigger points as well as the response to transient nerve blocks. So these are medicines that numb those nerves or that decrease the swelling and inflammation around those nerves for a while. In patients who benefit from those, then we know that this is one of the important triggers. So someone would have persistent pain that they've attempted to have managed medically. It's not working. They come to see you and then you do a nerve block to see how well they respond to that? Well, oftentimes that's done by neurologists, again, these headache specialists. And for many patients, um, focusing again on post-traumatic headaches here, that's enough to get them better. And, and you can have multiple rounds of these kinds of shots. Now for some patients, they get better for a little while, but then the headaches or local pain persists. And it's that subset of patients who would then get referred to me and we can discuss other options. And those options are? Um, there are other medical options as well, um, we, and typically, as I mentioned, it's the neurologists that drive that process. And then there are less invasive and more invasive procedures that one can do. So there are procedures like uh, radiofrequency ablation is one, in which those nerves are targeted with um, an energy device. And then there's, of course, surgical decompression, which is what I specialize in, in which we actually identify those specific nerves and release uh, under operative magnification, the scar tissue, the muscle, the fascia that is surrounding them and maybe compressing or damaging those nerves. Would you mind just defining a little bit for everyone, when you talk about fascia and you talk about scar tissue and the other things that could be causing this, explain that to me. How does that happen? Sure, like any nerve um, in your body is always traveling through some uh, specific locus. Um, in this area, our face and, and scalp, those nerves often tra travel through small spaces called foramina, um, and uh, they can get impinged in those spaces, particularly in the setting of uh, trauma where scar tissue can then build up around them and make a tight locus even tighter, or where the nerve itself swells in a confined space. That's, that's kind of when that happens. So you've decided then that someone is a surgical candidate, then what happens? Well, then they have, if uh, in consultation with me and their neurologist, we, we deem that um, surgery is a good option for them, then we give them all the risks and benefits, uh, potentially, of the operation, and we make a decision together about whether that's the best next step for them. And for some patients, it is, and um, we, we proceed down that path. And what about the operation itself? Is it a pretty complex operation? You know, uh, that's a great question. I mean, all surgeries I, I take very seriously, and, and most of us do, because um, they're all complex to some degree, but um, in the spectrum of things, this is a very safe, well-tolerated procedure. People tend to do very well. Um, the biggest thing is to make sure that the patient selection is appropriate. So these are folks who um, are likely to benefit from the procedure, but then most people appropriately selected tend to do pretty well with this. And it's an outpatient surgery. You don't end up typically staying in the hospital for this. And so they just, and how long do these surgeries typically last? It's a few hours, two to three hours on average. Tell me about the results. Yeah, great. Um, so for, again, appropriately selected patients, our goal is to get them to be more functional, to have fewer headaches, less severe headaches, or ideally both. And um, in my diagnostic criteria, patients who we'd select for that are, are those, as mentioned before, who've gotten some of those benefits from the nerve blocks Problem is it hasn't lasted for them. So our goal is to recapitulate what some of those blocks have done in terms of reducing the swelling or eliminating the pain sensation from that nerve, but more permanently. The studies that have been done have looked at six months, in some cases 12 months of duration or more. And the good news is for patients with post-traumatic headaches who have a good response to blocks, about 80% of them in those studies have a good response to surgery. Is a good response to surgery immediate? Are they gonna basically wake up and their headaches are gonna be gone? Sometimes patients get that, but I always counsel people to be a little bit more patient. And it, uh, the f figuring out which patients are gonna respond how quickly and, and um, the chronicity to which they've had headaches before they've come in is something the field is still working on. But absolutely, some patients will wake up feeling better. For others, it's more of an evolution. 
I'd like to just remind everybody who's watching that we'd love to have your questions and your comments, so please write in and let us know what's on your mind or if you have specific questions that you'd like to have answered. I'd like to go back to just the post-surgical period. Is it possible that somebody is going to have a little more prolonged time before they're actually going to see really good results? Yeah, sometimes that, that is the case. And the other thing that's important to emphasize, as I've stated several times here, is we tend to take a multidisciplinary approach. So I'm uh, using a sports analogy. If the neurologists are the quarterback of this process, I'm more of a special teams player. So, um, so the thing I can do is one of the interventions. But of course, the neurologists have many other tools uh, at their disposal, including other medications and things that in patients who have more prolonged uh, symptoms can also help. What about the durability of the results? Are there instances where somebody has the surgery, they may initially respond, and then they go back to having headaches again? That's a great question, Elizabeth. That's one of the enduring mysteries. In some patients, that does happen. I would say that the majority, at least in the studies that have been looked at over six or 12 months, tend to get durable relief over that period of time. Ultra long-term studies have not been performed, and that's an important gap in our knowledge that we'd like to fill. Um, but there are occasional patients who get initial relief and either sustain a secondary trauma or for unknown reasons have a recurrence, and they're still a mystery to us. Sounds like more studies are needed for Absolutely. that one. Yes. Of all comers with headaches, what percentage would be suitable candidates for this particular intervention? It, it's hard to quantify it in, a, exactly in terms of a percentage. And the, the challenge there is that headache is so common and there's so many distinct types. And there's cluster headaches, tension headaches, migraine headaches, and, and, and distinct etiologies. And there's a fair amount of overlap between these. So truly narrowing it down to a percentage is challenging given that degree of overlap. The easiest way I would say to describe it is for patients who meet those diagnostic criteria. So an anatomic point, a trigger point of headache that has responded to um, less invasive interventions like nerve blocks, it's that subset of patients who I think are reasonable surgical candidates. You've described to me already that most people come to this path because they've had some kind of a head injury. Yeah. Is there ever a time when a more peripheral injury will result in headaches that would also be amenable to treatment of this type? Yeah, I suppose it's possible, um, but I would say that the final common pathway there, if you will, is that uh, a compression or a damage to one of these peripheral nerves in the face and scalp that can trigger these headaches. And those would be diagnosed in the same way. There are many ways at which I suppose that could happen. The easiest to kind of rationalize is head trauma, direct head trauma. Tell me about research studies that might be ongoing and if you were the king of the forest and you could design the perfect study to establish very clearly the benefits of this, what might that look like? Well, I'll actually step out of that question for a moment and answer more broadly that, that, that one of the good news for patients is that there's a wealth of research that's happening in headache medicine. Uh, much of it driven by our colleagues in neurology. And that has led to new modalities and new medications, including things like Botox and other uh, neuromodulators that have emerged over the last decade, and including novel antibody-based therapies that are effective in some patients with chronic migraine, for example. So there's a lot of stuff coming. The studies that I want to do and that we're doing at Johns Hopkins are aimed at defining the best treatments for individual patients. So even within surgery, we're examining different surgical approaches. And within other uh, modalities as well, we're comparing the role of surgery with these other modalities and figuring out the optimal treatment plan for various patients. For someone who suspects that they may have a headache that would be well treated by the approach you're describing, what are the steps they should take in order to see someone like you? How easy is it to see someone like you? Yeah, great question. So I would say that the first step is to get in contact with either their primary care or a specialized neurologist who works in headache medicine. We're very fortunate here at Johns Hopkins to have an excellent headache center uh, within Hopkins, uh, but patients have these nationwide. And certainly the first step is to see their neurologist or failing that their primary care doctor who can get them on that path. How long would you say somebody should have a headache after trauma before they start really being concerned and start investigating options? Yeah, that's a terrific question. It's um, best uh, 
it's, it's best answered if we were sort of looking at the literature on it for patients who've had surgical interventions. Most patients have had these problems for months. And there's some thinking that the earlier one intervenes, the better off there are. There are other folks who feel that it's really a matter of six months or so of chronicity before we would contemplate this option. There's not a simple answer. It should really be tailored to the individual patient. But anytime you sustain a head trauma, you really want to get that checked out because there's many other things beyond headaches that can go on. And uh, you know your neurologist will be able to direct you appropriately. Okay. What else would you like to add? I think you've done a great job, Elizabeth. Just that there's, uh, there's hope for patients with chronic headaches. There's lots of medical and now non-medical options available to you. And um, we're happy to help you explore those further. Thank you so very much for joining me today. It's my pleasure. Thank you. That's Facebook Live from Johns Hopkins Medicine.